Welcome to Reframed, a podcast created to educate, encourage, and inspire parents and professionals. The Gladney Center for Adoption staff know parenting a child that has a history of loss, abuse, neglect, or trauma requires parenting skills and insight to be reframed in order to create a loving and caring environment. Reframed host Emily Moorhead and guests strive to make an impact on our world through topics that are important to you, your family, and our communities. And now, here's your host, Emily Moorhead. Hi, and welcome back to Reframed. Today we're answering your questions. I have our guest, Jennifer Lanter, with me today, who's the brains behind our Reframed podcast. And we're going to be talking about all the hot topics in adoption that you sent us. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Emily. It's so fun to be here. So tell me about yourself. Okay. I've worked at Gladney for over 20 years. I hate saying that because it makes me seem super old. You just started really young. I know. I did. I started fresh out of college, and that's true. My degree is in communication, and I guess the thing that I'm the most proud of is I'm a Gladney mom. When I first started working here, I didn't know that I would need Gladney in the way that I did. We already had a biological child, but Gladney ended up being not only the place that I work, but also the place that gave us our family. That's precious. So your heart behind a lot of our education initiatives really come from you being a Gladney mom, Absolutely. which is really special. That's the truth. So we have some questions today, and you're our expert. It's kind of fun, a little I ask the wait. expert. So um, viewers sent in questions that they had for us to talk about with adoption. And so they're kind of all over the place, and it's really exciting because I think that they're really the hot topics in adoption that people want to know about. So let's get started. Okay. So what programs does Gladney have for families who want to adopt? Well, Gladney is proud to offer three really important programs to our adoptive parents. The first program that I'm gonna talk about is our domestic infant program, and that is a pro program designed um, to place infants with adoptive parents. We work with expectant moms in the community and can sometimes place the baby as soon as 48 hours after delivery. Okay. We also have a program that works directly with the state. We partner with the state, and I think we're one of the very few adoption agencies, maybe even the only adoption agency, that works with the state and can um, place children straight into their permanent homes, meaning that parents don't have to foster first. Okay. And then we also have several international adoption programs at Gladney. So I want to clarify, so you mentioned a program where families can adopt from the foster care system. Can you clarify what that program is like? Because I know that there's a lot of programs out there that are your foster parents or your a foster parent and then maybe you can adopt. What does that look like for Gladney? So I'm excited because for Gladney that means that we get to place children whose parental rights have already been terminated. So they are available for adoption and they can go into their new adoptive home as soon as possible. Okay. So Gladney is unique in the sense that parents don't have to foster with Gladney to make an adoption plan. They can um, adopt a child directly from foster care into their home. Okay, so these are parents who say, yes, we want to become parents, we want to adopt a child, and so they go straight the adoption route in that. Yes, and fun fact, that's our biggest need in the United States. Really? So we need parents for children who need homes and foster care. Okay, and so families, I think a lot of times think like, oh, we could adopt an infant and help with those numbers. Is That's different, it sounds like to that's me. That's different. They're still solving an important problem because okay. I believe, and I think a lot of people at Gladney believe that sometimes when we're, um, we're working with an expectant mom who's unprepared to parent, mm -hmm. if women are parenting and they're not prepared to parent, that can mean that that baby could end up in our foster care system mm -hmm. from abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. So really adoption can be the prevention yeah. to foster care if you think about it that way. So it's still very much needed, but there are so many children in Texas and around our in, in the whole country mm -hmm. that need that are cu currently available for adoption. Their parental rights have been severed and they need a home. And okay. so that's a big need for us. That sounds incredibly important. Talk to me about, if that's Gladney's biggest need, talk to me about what the fees are for those families in that program. Well, that's fun to talk about okay. because there's really not any adoption fees related to that program. Okay. There are some small fees, such as like a home study fee that parents would need to pay. But as far as the program itself, there's not any program fees associated with that. Also, if you're 
adopting from the state foster care system, then parents get a unique benefit of like a college ed education and their child can be on Medicaid. Wow. So there are some financial benefits to adopting from that program too, because the state wants to support these kiddos mm -hmm. and make sure that we're finding homes for them and that price is not a barrier to that. Absolutely. And I think that's a huge myth in the community is that adoption is always expensive. And so I love hearing that there are several ways families can make that work and can continue to support their child to, for life, you know, through a college education and receiving proper medical care. That's phenomenal. I think so too. So with any of those adoption programs, are there any requirements for attending like a support group or education? What does that look like? So for each program that we have, education is a very important component because what we want to do is make sure that we're providing the best outcomes possible for families and children. Mm -hmm. And so education is an important part of the process for each program. Mm -hmm. The other part of your question was, are support groups required? Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily required, but it is going to set our parents up for success. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of, um, Gladney has a very unique program called Gladney Family Associations. Mm -hmm. They're all across the country and they're designed um, to help support for parents to find support within their community and connection with other people who have gone through that adoption journey. Yes. And so I think that just from an adoptive parent's perspective, I know that when we we're going through the journey and even now our son is, is 14 years old, we love to connect with other people who have walked a similar journey and our GFAs can do that. That's really cool. So it's an option, it's not a requirement. Um, and I think when you're in the parenting trenches, sometimes there are times where you're like, whoa, I need help. Mm -hmm. Where other times you've got this and you've had the education and the resources. And so even in different time periods of your life, there's different needs for that. Yeah, because sometimes you may not want to contact Gladney and talk about your struggles. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just need peer support. Maybe you just want to talk to another mom or another dad. And so that's what the GFAs are best at. One of the questions that a viewer had was, could you specify gender in any of your adoption programs? So could you say like, it's an all-boy household, I'm outnumbered, we want to adopt a girl, or is that something that would be a problem? So that's a unique benefit of adoption is that depending on the program, you could do that. Okay. You can't do it for domestic infant adoption because if you're working with an expectant mom and she's um, and you're matched and things are going well and she finds out the gender of her baby and it's not the gender that you had wanted, sure. then that's that, that could be really disruptive to the adoption process and really unfair to the expectant mom that we're working with. That makes sense. It does make sense. So it's not possible in that program. Mm -hmm. But for international and adopting from our state foster care system, absolutely. I've heard families come in who are adopting internationally or from foster care, and the families have said like what I just said, like there are too many boys in this house <laughs> or too many girls, like we are coming in for a girl or a boy, we need to change the number dynamic, and that's always really cute and funny to hear. I totally get it. Yeah, and then sometimes they end up adopting the gender that they were not planning on. Because that happens too. There was a connection. So I They mean, fell in love. There's, there's always a plan that we just don't quite understand, so that's pretty cute. A viewer asked if there were adoptions of kids eight and older, so that seems like a a child or an age range that they were able to parent, maybe they don't want to do the diaper phase. What does that look like for them? Well, that we have two great programs for that. So we have, again, back to foster care and our international programs. Okay. And international, um, they're all ages and stages of kiddos, okay. um, but they're usually a little bit older. Okay. Um, so they're past the toddler stage usually. And then for our foster care families that are wanting to adopt, um, those children in that program are usually six and up. Okay. And there's, there's a reason for that. Um, the state really tries to keep families together for as long as possible and give parents second and third chances. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, sometimes by the time those parental rights are, are, are relinquished, then really that child is a little bit older. Okay. And we have lots of sibling groups in both of those programs too. Okay. So sometimes you'll see a, um, maybe there's a two or three year old child, but they have you know a brother that's seven or eight and a mm -hmm. sister that's six. And so um, if you're open to adopting a sibling group, then you can get a younger child in that mix sometimes. Okay, very cool. Um, one of my questions was, and a viewer asked it as well, sometimes there are women in the community who are parenting and they find themselves in a difficult situation. So I thought I had a parenting plan, I thought people were gonna show up for me, and then they just kind of stopped and I don't have the support that I need. So what happens for them if they're placing a child, maybe that's not a newborn, maybe that's a toddler, um, or even a little bit older, what does that look like and what program would 
what programs could families inquire about for that? Well, first, let me just say that I have a huge heart for that yeah. because I know that's hard for that mama to come forward and say, mm -hmm. you know what, I'm, I'm not able to do this at this time of my life. Mm -hmm. Of course, it doesn't mean that she doesn't love her baby or that she doesn't want her baby. It just means she's really not equipped and she wants to do something positive before something bad happens. So yeah. have a lot of respect for that. So Gladney has an infant, toddler, and child program. And so that, de depending on the situation, mm -hmm. uh, we can place that child in our um, domestic program okay. with, with a domestic program family. And that, that has a, a really unique look, I guess, mm -hmm. because we do lots of counseling with that, with that mama to make sure that this is the right choice for her. Mm -hmm. We want to first offer her a respite just to make sure she doesn't need a rest mm -hmm. and make sure that she's plugged in to community resources mm -hmm. and that she has the tools that could help her be successful if she decided she could do that. Okay. If she takes a look at that, at her situation and is like, you know, really, I don't have the support that I need. I don't even have housing or a job. And I think this is the best plan moving forward. That adoption plan would look like any other plan with an expectant mom. Okay. She gets to choose the adoptive family. She gets to have contact. She chooses the openness with the family. So it's a it's a beautiful plan and it can come together really well. Well, there's a lot of people that work to make that happen for her. So I used to work in the CPS system. And so even when I'm hearing you describe that, that could be a really good option to share with women who might you know, be in difficult situations parenting and might need options. And it sounds like that gives space and time for processing and counseling. So that's a really important program, I think, that our community understands. Absolutely an important program, and it's a growing program. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good to know. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the average placement time. That was a big question that we got from a lot of viewers. So tell me about that. That is always a big question. That was one of my big questions, and I worked here, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to know, when is that? When am I going to have a baby? Yeah. I need to know that. Yes. And unfortunately, we don't always have the answer to that, but I can tell you that the more flexible and open families are mm -hmm. to different expectant mom and father backgrounds, mm -hmm. then the probably the likelier they are to have placement a little bit quicker. Okay. But the average, um, I think, range is anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Okay, very good. Um, and you were talking about sibling groups earlier. I'm wondering even I, from what I've heard, those can go a little bit quicker. So that's true. They can zero to three really quick. That's right. <laughs> yes. And if you're, yes, if you're adopting, I was talking about the domestic infant program okay. primarily, but so the other programs do tend to go a little bit faster. A little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. That's funny. So tell me about um, families who are, tell me about families who are worried about the cost of adoption. Mm -hmm. What resources does Gladney provide for that? Well, first of all, I get it. Mm -hmm. I have been on that side as well. And I remember looking at um, everything that we had been through, the cost of our infertility, the cost not only in time, but also financial resources and just wondering how we were going to do it. I'm really proud of Gladney's financial model because we worked really hard to be really transparent for families and provide lots of options for them. Mm -hmm. In our domestic infant program, we have a basically a just a all-inclusive fee. Mm -hmm. So everything that you can imagine from the beginning of your process all the way to the to uh, placement mm -hmm. is all one fee. Even if the expectant mom that they're working with changes their mind and decides to parent, mm -hmm. there will not be any more fees assessed. Okay. We absorb that. Okay. And so we offer lots of scholarship programs for that. Mm -hmm. We also offer um, a lot of resources and tools. You can find those on our website okay. um, that explain kind of the breakdown of, of how that works and, and what they can apply for and what resources resources are available to them. Yeah. We also encourage them to be vulnerable with their family and community. Mm -hmm. To share, it's a it's really an opportunity to share with the community about their adoption and kind of engage the community mm -hmm. and educate them on the need and adoption, but it's also a chance for people to be um, supportive and and help you in your adoption journey. I remember when my husband and I were trying to figure out how we were going to pay for the cost of adoption. Um, we decided to go to our family and just tell them what was happening and explain where the need was. Mm -hmm. And we kind of socked ourselves up for this big, we were having a family meeting. Mm -hmm. And I remember we got um, to my grandmother's house and we walked in the door and she goes, I've got a blank check on the counter. I just want you to tell me how much you need. I want to support you. Mm -hmm. And I remember my heart just broke into a million pieces because I, she knew what I needed before I even asked her. Yeah. But then that following Sunday, we went to church and our Sunday school class had mm -hmm. taken up a collection. Oh, wow. And and I didn't, 
you know, at first it's so hard to ask for help when you need it. But for me, I was like, I realized this is a, a way for the community to be a part of our journey. Mm -hmm. And so they were all really invested. And it was a fun way to kind of show our excitement and our love and, um, and really our need with our community and our family. And it was very vulnerable and rewarding. Mm -hmm. So we encourage families to do all those things, even though it may feel uncomfortable at first. There are a lot of creative um, solutions out there, such as selling t-shirts and GoFundMe accounts, lots of different things like that. I love an adoption t-shirt. Like, I yes, I will buy all of them. <laughs> I have a collection. Yes, And I'm too. actually thinking about making a quilt out of them. But yes, yes I love that. And so, um, and for, I already mentioned that our adopting from the state foster care system, that there's really not a fee mm -hmm. associated with that. Yeah. And then international adoption, the fee is set by the country. Mm -hmm. And then we encourage the same thing for families just to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and to look to their community and their resources for Absolutely. help. Absolutely. I love those ideas. I went to an adoption garage sale one time and they didn't price anything. And so basically what happened is like, people were like, I want this lamp for $100. I mean, nothing feels better than that. It does. It, was it so feels sweet. so good. You just, and you just love that lamp too. Yeah. Yes, there's a meaning behind it. Story. Like your quilt that you want to do, which I love that idea. It's really sweet. So one of the things that we just talked about um, when you were talking about domestic infant adoption fee was that it's a single fee. So I think it's important that we clarify for our viewers if for some reason an expectant mom decided that she did have the resources to parent, would that family lose any of their money um, being matched with her or what would that process look like for them? So we totally understand that that is that can happen in the adoption process and that it is really the expectant mom's choice to decide if she wants to make an adoption plan or parent her baby yeah. and we support her through that journey we also educate parents that that can happen i think i think it happens pretty rarely at gladney in the sense that um it's between 20 and 30 percent of the time mm -hmm. um that a match will fall through and then and then what happens is the adoptive family's profile goes back into our our program Mm -hmm. and then and the process kind of starts over again their profile goes out but they are not assessed another fee and we do walk with them on that journey because we know that's that's painful that's another loss for them mm -hmm. and so we really work closely with them to help them through that that space yeah and it sounds like because I know expectant moms and receive a lot of counseling that, that typically the number is that low because they've been given a lot of options and have talked about a parenting plan and have talked about yes. um, an adoption plan. And so the resources are built into that. And families are typically informed of that during that process. They are. We can typically along that journey, we can kind of sometimes see if she's starting to make that turn. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can communicate that to the family and kind of give them a heads up. So we're, we're working. We're, working with both parties really closely and making sure that we're counseling on both sides. Okay. One viewer asked if we were a faith-based organization. Can you clarify that for them? Sure, I'd love to. We were founded by a Methodist minister in, back in 1887, back in the day, but Gladney is not a faith-based organization today. So we work with all faiths and non-faiths. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just a, an inclusive and open organization. Awesome. Jennifer, leave our viewers with your favorite adoption tip or story? I have so many stories. I wish I had time to share all of them. But I think my favorite adoption tip is that that while sometimes it seems hopeless on this journey, that if you start working with Gladney, that that's where the hope really begins. Mm -hmm. And if you work with us, you will have a family. And it's no more, you know, just a certain percentage of chance this fertility treatment would work or this one would work. It's really about making a choice to build your family through adoption, and you will have a family. Whenever I drive in every day, I, I have a specific way that I drive into work because it says where hope is born, and every day that feels so right, and it feels like exactly what you just said. It does I feel love right. that. And it's to the truth. Yeah. I'm a testament to that. Thank you for joining us today, Jennifer, and for sharing your story and the passion behind your work um, and this organization. We're so grateful to have you on. Well, thank you, Emily. I sure do appreciate your work, too. We talked about a lot of really important questions today. And if you have further questions and want to research more information, feel free to check out our show notes where there's resources and links. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Reframed Podcast. Be sure to visit GladneyUniversity.org to access the show notes and discover upcoming trainings at Gladney University. We'd love your feedback, so please head to iTunes and rate, review, and subscribe. 
Until next time.